this evening from the letter Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. While we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, He it is who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify for Himself a people of His own who are zealous for good deeds. This is the word of life. Thanks Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I get tired of the headlines telling us about the latest fatal shooting in our country. Just this week, another one in our own city. But in the last few weeks, I've read about fatal shootings in traffic and parking lots and grocery stores, sometimes in neighborhoods or even in a family home. Just as Advent was beginning early in this month, I read a story recounting that we are living through a period of history where we're witnessing a record number of homicides in our own country. We're living through a period of time, I believe, where the value of human life is being diminished. Seems to be fueled by illicit drug traffic, some mental illness, some greed, and ready access to deadly firearms. But as I was reflecting all, on all of this, it seems to me that there is another factor at play here. It seems to me that we are veering away from our best selves and our highest values toward becoming a culture of attack where people feel free to attack someone physically or verbally or emotionally it can happen in fatal shootings but it also happens in a lot of other ways in our everyday lives i heard a story not long ago about a little league sports team dad's coaching elementary boys one dad made a call the other dad didn't like it they're on the same team mind you and the other dad starts attacking the one who makes the call. But it's not just out there. It's not just in sports. It's not just in shooting. It happens in churches too. The pastor says some, something someone doesn't like, and you can be sure here comes a letter or an email attacking something someone has said has become so common even in our churches. Maybe you've experienced it in your own life, at work or with your family or someone who you had counted as a friend who has turned on you and decided attacking you is the best course to follow. But it's not just our time and place. It's been happening in the church from the very beginning. You can read about it in our own scriptures in our earliest Christian communities where they were struggling with this. Just two verses beyond where I read to you in Titus, this advice is given to the Christians. Remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, And to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. That's advice given to the church in terms of how they're supposed to treat each other, would not have been written unless they were doing those things to one another. The church is not perfect. It never has been. But there is something here in our story that invites us to do better, 
to grow in our faith and to live it out in our lives. There is good news here tonight that God has sent someone to rescue us, to show us a better way, or as Paul says in one of his other letters, to show us a more excellent way. It's the way of love. The way our text said it tonight, if I can read it to you again, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all bringing salvation to all the Christian message is that we are saved by grace, or you could say saved by God's unconditional love for us. And not only saved from the guilt of our sin or wrongdoing, but the gospel proclaims that we are given power through God's love revealed to us in Jesus Christ to overcome this culture of attack, this destructive power of sin that sometimes takes over our lives. In verse 12, Titus describes this power of salvation at work in our lives like this. He says it's training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. It's a challenge to get better, to do better. Could our world enjoy some of us living more upright lives, being more upright citizens, living more godly, thinking more about what Christ would have us do in our everyday lives before we make rash decisions. I think you would experience it as a blessing in your life, but it would also be a blessing to the whole world if we would take this advice. Perhaps God is calling us to be an antidote in the world to this culture of t attack. For those of us who claim that we are saved and we know God's love to embody it in the world, just as the story of a baby tells us that God's divine love is embodied in a person living in the world. We are called to live that same kind of life. At the end of our reading this evening, here in Titus, it says the way we will know is that these people will be a people for Christ who are zealous for good deeds. Zealous for good deeds. Could we use more people in our world who were zealous to do good? Could we use more leaders who were zealous to do good and were thinking of the greater good of the community rather than something that might give them a political advantage or enrich them, or promote something they're doing. Oh, if we would find more people who are zealous for good deeds, maybe they are here tonight. Every week we have organized mission and outreach activities helping people in need. But beyond those that are organized, it's a very common experience to get a phone call here at the church where someone has an emergency need. A typical story is that health problems have come along, they've become unemployed, and all of a sudden their income is gone, their bills are still there. Sometimes their health has caused such problems that they cannot work any longer. We had a call like that the other day. The woman was just asking for prayer for her health. But as one of our staff people continued to talk with her, other needs became apparent. Before I knew it, the staff and other people in our congregation were at work organizing a way to respond, going to the house, assessing the needs, building a ramp, fixing other things at the house that she needed help with. I would say that all of those people, from the ones doing the praying to the ones doing the hammering, we're all people zealous for good deeds. Not perfect people, just those who are know that they are saved by God's love and grace and have opened their heart and mind and spirit in such a way that they've been shaped and formed by that divine love. And they're expressing it in their everyday lives. They are now motivated by love 
John Wesley, founder of Methodism, talked about it as being perfected in love. That God was calling us to strive to be people who are motivated by nothing but love in all that we say and do. Oh, I think the world would rejoice if more of us were motivated by love like that. For salvation, like Titus is talking about, is not a one-time event. It is a process of being shaped and formed into the image of love after the likeness of Christ. Titus says it like this, that Christ has come, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds the gospel is trying to pull us back from a culture of attack and pull us into a culture of love and goodness and faith and peace and joy to call us back from being those who blast others to be those who bless others through christ this story we've read tonight and the gospels promise us That as we respond to God's love being offered to us, that we'll be transformed. And in fact, we'll become a blessing rather than a burden in this world of ours. This baby we celebrate being born on this Christmas Eve, the Gospels tell us, is a sign of all of this. You heard this passage from Luke earlier where the messenger of God comes to the shepherds and says, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace and goodwill among the people. I believe God wants us to have peace and goodwill among us and around the world. God wants us to have a grace-filled, a grace-infused life every day. God wants us to know peace and goodwill joy and hope and love god wants us to have more than a life of attack or being attacked god wants more for each and every one of us than what we see going on in everyday culture all around us This story this evening proclaims that God is at work and is coming to us and offering us love and transformation and fullness of life if we will but believe. We believe that giving attention to God's intention in the world, whether it's in our lives or in our prayers, is really important and can change the course of our lives. That's why we handed you a prayer card tonight inviting you to be in prayer in concert with us, praying for your person or your situation because we believe that God can change us and lift us up and heal us when we're broken and lead us when we're lost and comfort us when we're grieving and bring us to fullness of life. The gospel says, oh, it can happen. It's the promise of Christmas. I'll close with this story. It's a true story of a girls' basketball team in the northern part of the United States. One night, they're dressed, ready to play. They're in their locker room. They're the visitors that night, and they begin to hear the chants from up in the gym And the chants are using derogatory names for them because they are all Native American girls. They're a little stunned, frankly, that this is happening. But the time comes for them to climb the stairs and go through the tunnel and out onto the floor to play this game. They get to the tunnel and the seniors 
senior girls on the team who usually lead them out onto the floor turn to the coach and say, we don't want to go because they can hear the chanting, the hostility of the crowd that is going to surround the court. They all hesitate until one young woman, a freshman on the team, says, I've got an idea. I will go. And by herself, she slowly walks to the center of the court. The crowds are still chanting negative things about her and her people. And she simply begins to tap her foot. And then begins to sway and move and begins to dance around the center court circle. Before long, she's twirling and prancing and dancing, and the crowd is quieting. As she's dancing, she begins to sing once they are quiet. And by the time she is finished, a couple of minutes later, the crowd erupts into applause and cheers and acclamation and support. She has changed hostility into praise and admiration. She has changed hate, I think, into connection because she boldly celebrated who she was and who her people were and how they approached life. I believe she was a person of goodwill and peace. And she invited all the others in the arena to make a new decision about how they would be as people going forward. May we be so bold and so gentle in living out our faith. May we find the way of grace and beauty in the midst of hostility. May we seize on this message of peace and love that we find in the manger offered to us tonight. May God save each and every one of us. May God save us all. Amen. And thanks be to God.